you should definitely be paying attention to opportunity zones primarily because of the tax benefits. I mean, if you have a piece of property and you go to sell that property and you use the proceeds to invest in an opportunity zone fund or a qualified opportunity zone business, you hold the investment for 10 years, the entire capital gains liability will go away. This episode brought to you by Suites at Madison. Meeting in conference rooms for rent by the hour, week, month, or year. Suites at Madison, where business gets done. Check them out at www.downtowntampaoffice.com. Now, on to the show. You are listening to the Invest Florida Real Estate Show, covering topics in lending, buy and sell strategies, property management, hot markets, and tips and tools to guide you along the way on your path to real estate success. You want Florida investment real estate talk? You have come to the right place. And now, our hosts, Eric Odom and Stephen Silverman. Hello and welcome to another episode of the Invest Florida Real Estate Show. This is your co-host, Eric Odom, along with Stephen Silverman. Stephen, what's the good word? Well, another day, another battle. Uh, th things are still moving fast in the state of Florida in brokerage, and we're seeing deals getting done, but you have to be careful. Yeah, I mean, we had our sales meeting today talking with the agents in the office, and you know, we had a particular scenario where a property basically had been over-improved, right, Stephen? It's over-improved, and the poor owner is crying because he can't get his money back. And we feel for him. We really do. But uh, you can't do more than the neighborhood will bear. Yeah. And folks will go in and buy, hey, this is a nine cap. It's a 10 cap. And then not really pay attention to the amount of money that has to be invested or miss dramatically on the amount of money that has to be invested to get it up to what would be considered market standards. And when the smoke clears, you end up in a situation where you just overpay for the property and and didn't calculate those things in. So at the end of the day, hear me. The, the you know the the moral of the story is to make sure that by the time you put what you want to put into it, that the numbers actually make sense. Or trying to sell it, it just is not going to happen. You're just going to take a bath on the back end. Mm -hmm. Steve, we had a great guest today. Uh, we've got uh, a repeat, a retread, right? Yeah, it's like we're going to have to be like Saturday Night Live. You know, when you get uh, Alex Baldwin, who's been on 10 times, and he gets a special jacket, um, we, we're going to have to get some jackets. But um, we're not quite there yet. No, but we're going to talk about Opportunity Zone, so we'll get into that in a moment. Wanted to just ask our listeners, if you have had not, not had the opportunity to leave a review for us, we would greatly appreciate it. And we work really hard. Our producer, Joshua, uh, works hard at trying to get – Folks to come on the show, it's not easy, and your reviews help. It's it's a fact that that potential guests will go on and look to see who's listening and what kind of comments they're seeing, and that helps them decide whether they're going to invest their time with us. So if you haven't left the review yet, please do so. Wanted to just read a quick review here from Ron Baxter. I just sent it in. He says, I listen most every morning while preparing for work. Your shows are both informative and interesting. I'm working in Utah right now, but I have an investment property in St. Augustine, Florida. So I really enjoy hearing about my favorite state and what's going on in real estate. I really only have one suggestion, actually two. Eric, let Stephen finish his sentences. Oh, and Stephen, I would like to hear more about your investment strategies concerning storage units in the state of Florida. I'm really interested in asset class. Anyway, keep up the good work. I Really enjoy listening to the podcast. Steven, um, you know, I, I don't want to sell Ron short. appreciate the input, but my first suspicion is that the relative uh, antennas have, uh, have gone up here. Well, Eric, I noticed the long pause. And, you know, I just want to point out to you that, that generally, and we've discussed this before, we have to listen to listeners because they tell the truth. You know, I, I, I had maybe, to read, maybe you talk too much. I had to read your expression as I read that review <laughs> to make sure that Ron was not a plan. And we're going to give Ron the benefit of the doubt here, but I will try to pay attention if I am interrupting you uh, too often. Fr Ron, we appreciate uh, you listening to us in all seriousness and, and the update. Stephen, is there anything you want to uh, cover in relation to uh, storage at the, at the present time? Well, um, you know, the – 
strategies is a whole separate discussion and what people are doing, but there is a a, a change in trend, and, and that is storage also always used to be horizontal, and now you're seeing it going more urban and more vertical, and the buildings are beautiful. They're expensive, and they're beautiful, but it's the darlings of REITs right now, and investors are favoring it, so I worry a little bit about too much storage coming, but there's a lot of multifamily coming, which will help support that. Well, they've long been, storage units are speaking about, sort of for the suburban class. So they're built out, in, in Florida at least, they're built out in a cow pasture someplace. And of course, now that we're having this infill and, and you know, refocus on our, on our urban centers, the, people still have things that they need to store. And, and so you're seeing this basically change in philosophy going vertical with the storage units. And that's, that's a, that's a big change. I've, you know, that we've seen, um, really across uh, all of our urban, urban areas and t- Tampa, Orlando. Um, I'm sure it's happening in St. Augustine too. I mean, it's people moving back in the inner city is putting more pressure on it. So Stephen, anything else you want to comment on storage units? No, I mean, we have one property under contract. It's, you know, under 0.7 acres and it'll hold up over 105,000 square feet. So the landscape's definitely changed, but we'll have that on another discussion. Let's move into our show. Today we have with us Stephen Rinaldi. Stephen Rinaldi is in for a repeat. He's been on our show before and we asked him to come back. Stephen uh, has his own law firm in downtown Bethesda, concentrating in business law matters and intellectual property matters. Prior to September 2005, he was a software licensing attorney for Mercury Interactive. He was the Associate General Counsel of the American Bankers Association and was responsible for all business agreements for a $30 million a year division of the association. He handles all kinds of real estate-related activities such as private placements, angel investment, venture capital, mergers and acquisitions, technology issues, etc. Stephen, Welcome back to the Invest Florida show. Thank you very much, gentlemen. Hey, Steve, really appreciate you taking the time and investing with us again. Uh, some exciting stuff. Uh, you know, this opportunity zone that we're going to talk about today and that, that you're going to be covering has it's been a pretty significant change. And obviously, if people want to go back and listen to the last episode, Stephen does a lot of work with securities and he helps investors get ramped up regardless of what type of private placement, whether it be crowdfunding or, or, or the traditional Reg D uh, private placements. But the, why don't you talk to us a little bit, Stephen, about this opportunity zone and why it's exciting and why real estate investors should be paying attention. You should definitely be paying attention to opportunity zones primarily because of the tax benefits. I mean, if you have a piece of property and you go to sell that property and you use the proceeds to invest – in an opportunity zone fund or a qualified opportunity zone business, and you are to hold the, you hold that investment for five years, 10% of your capital gains tax liability goes away. You hold the investment for seven years, 15% of your capital gains tax liability goes away. You hold the investment for 10 years, the entire capital gains liability will go away. But you have to take the entire proceeds of the sale and put it into an opportunity zone, either an opportunity zone business or opportunity zone fund. Partial sales won't work. So it actually gives you a lot of the same benefits that you get on a 1031, except for that if you're holding it for long periods of time, it actually is better. It's, It's actually even better than 1031 because 1031, 1031 sounds great today, tomorrow and next week. But, you know, you put your money into a 1031 property and let's say a REIT or a larger partnership comes along and they want to do a stock acquisition of you at that point, then you're facing possible issues. So it's actually a little more flexible than 1031. And and let's just for those that are trying to get ramped up here, uh, 1031, a section code section 1031 allows like kind exchanges of of appreciated assets with deferring the taxes. In other words, if you own a, let's say a single family home that you bought for a hundred thousand dollars and you sold it for $200,000, if you're, if you're going to roll that money into another piece of real estate, like kind, 
doesn't matter whether it's a warehouse or an apartment complex, whatever it is, you're able to defer those capital gains and not have to pay the capital gains on on the taxes. So the 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 opportunity zones, if we're hearing you properly, Stephen, they're allowing you to actually sell a piece of property and roll it in not only into a, a, a real estate investment inside of an opportunity zone, it can be a company or a fund, and that gives a lot more flexibility than what you would typically see in a quote-unquote like-kind 1031. Is that accurate? Yes, absolutely, by all means. Whereas, yeah, 1031 is just straight property for property and nothing else. And so um, in in the opportunity zone, uh, you, you did mention you have to invest the entire proceeds. Does it have to go into – um, one fund or one property, or can you allocate it amongst different opportunity investments? If the fund qualifies as a qualified opportunity zone fund, you will be fine. Okay. Okay. So that the fund could be stretched out among 20 or 30 properties into opportunity zones and you would be fine. Okay. So let's just talk a little um, about what an opportunity zone is. And how and where you can find it. Yeah, where you can figure out like what where is the or other opportunity zone zones that you can look for. Every state is entitled to nominate up to twenty five lower income census tracts to be opportunity zones. And they nominate it to the Department of the Treasury, which then accepts it. And the Department of Treasury has a list, or even better yet, if you don't want to go through each state, each state's economic development authority has a list. And they will gladly, if, if you can't find it, you can call them up and they will gladly give you the link on the site to their list. Okay. And we'll make sure we'll try to get those uh, listed up there, Stephen, for our listeners. So, so Stephen, let me ask you a question. Um, if, if I want to start an Opportunity Zone Fund, what do I need to do to start one? Okay, you need to do two things. You have to pre-file Form 8996 with the IRS, Okay. And the second thing you have to do is the fund has to invest 90% of its assets into what's called qualified opportunity zone property. And qualified opportunity zone property is three things. It's the stock of an opportunity zone business that's a corporation. It can be the partnership interest of an opportunity zone partnership. And partnership is defined to include LLCs. It's The IRS is using the term as any entity taxable as a partnership. Or third, it is qualified opportunity zone business property. That's the tricky one of the three. St- you know, the stock of a qualified opportunity zone business or the partnership interests of a qualified opportunity zone are, are pretty straightforward. 70% of the assets of that corporation or partnership have to be in the opportunity zone and 50% of the revenues of that corporation or partnership have to come from the opportunity zone. So the opportunity zone fund founder or, or promoter has to do a lot of due diligence on the target investments. On the property side, business property, that's where things get tricky. And the trick here is you got to substantially improve the property. And what does that mean? Best way to do that is let me give you an example. Let's say you got a million dollar multifamily apartment building, okay? And let's say the land is worth a half million and the building is worth a half million. If the fund acquires that property for a million, the fund has to put a half million dollars of improvements into it. Qualified opportunity zone business property has to be substantially improved. So from what I'm understanding that maybe – Something like vacant land in an opportunity zone would be a, a good opportunity because you have to improve that. Absolutely. Vacant land, abandoned houses, abandoned houses that you can get rezoned into commercial, houses that you can get rezoned into a new multifamily dwelling, you know, houses in complete and utter disrepair, something that's like sure. you know, 20, 30,000 in, De- in Detroit, for example. And, and you're going to knock it. You're going to assemble three or four tracks together, knock them down, and put up a, multi, a new multifamily dwelling. You'll probably easily meet the threshold in that case. I think the uh, our, the re uh, word for that, the term, the buzzword for that is handyman special. Yes. <laughs> 
know, we see those all the time. So, so look inside of the opportunity zone and you're looking for either developing or building or significantly improving uh, the property. And it seems like your revenues being generated inside of the opportunity fund makes it tough on businesses, or maybe I'm understanding this improperly. It can be tough because you've got to have 70% of the assets mm. of like a corporation or partnership. To, you know, that, that has to be a qualified opportunity zone business. So 70% of their assets has to be in the zone and 50% of their revenues has to be in the zone. Hey, let's talk about a hypothetical. You've got a large company that wants to put an assembly plant inside of an opportunity zone. This assembly plant is going to be a fraction of the assets of the holding company, but the holding company is going to be putting the building and the structure inside of the opportunity zone and hiring opportunity zone folks and having opportunity folks run it. But it's, it's, it sounds like it'd be disqualified because the majority of the assets are held by the holding company outside of the opportunity. No, because that's the business, yes. but they're investing in a property now. You have to remember that the qualified opportunity zone business, which is a corporation, a partnership, has to be formed after December 31, 2017. Okay. So it it's really applies more to the newer yeah. entities. Newer entities. Okay. So, 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 they, so they could just form a new entity for that, for that development then. Yeah, you got the issue of them being controlled by an existing sure. entity. Mm-hmm. How's the IRS going to determine that one? Right. That's what that's what I'm getting at. It gets it becomes a sticky wicket. So, you know, for our purposes, let's just focus on the real estate side because that's what all of our folks know. Even though you know that we'll let them also understand that there are some other opportunities on the corporate side to to that they but there's but, but it's probably outside of the scope of of us being able to cover here. So we'll stick just inside of the real estate discussion. Well, you have a, could have a situation, particularly on the partnership front, where you know the, the partnership itself invests in real estate in the qualified opportunity zone. Sure. Yeah. And that would enable someone who wanted to do a 1031 exchange to not do a 1031 exchange, but instead to grab partnership units, mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. which may be more valuable down the road. So in, in forming one of these funds, um, is there are there any secure uh, – like – Traps with the Security Exchange Commission or, or things that people have to be careful about? Yeah, let's start with a 30,000 foot from the security side. Stephen wants to buy a piece of real estate inside of, I, I need to qualify this, Silverman. <laughs> Silverman needs to, SS. Yes, needs to buy. SS, not SR. So SS needs, to, he wants to buy a piece of uh, property inside of an opportunity uh, zone and he wants a couple of investors to go in with him. Obviously, we know from your previous episode that that's a security. He's told, telling uh, third-party individuals that he's gonna they're gonna make a profit and he's gonna run it for them. So let's talk about how we structure that type of situation, um, Stephen. Okay, in that case, he's just buying into. It's not a fund. He's just per se buying into qualified opportunity zone property or sure. partnership interests or corporate interests. Okay. In that case, there are several options you can take so you don't have to go through full blown registration. Number one, you could do a rule 504 offering, which exempts offerings up to 5 million. The problem with 504 is you might have to go through state registration and the state rules you know, what you may have to disclose in one state might be different from another. It's not really uniform. The better angle is probably 506B or even potentially 506C, but 506B lets you go to 35 or fewer unaccredited investors and an unlimited number of accredited investors with a, with an unlimited dollar amount. And it's fairly uniform among the states as well. There are a few states where I have, I have to use a different exemption if it's a 506B offering, but it's not generally a problem. 506C is another possibility, but even there, you'd have to have accredited investors only. You could advertise, but they have to, have to be accredited only. And that's tough because a lot of people are getting money from family and friends who definitely aren't accredited. Yeah, particularly those folks that are doing it for the first, for the first second, third time. Normally, after you build a track record in, you start attracting more of those larger institutional type investors. It, it matters less because you you sort of zone in on a handful of investors that are uh, institutional guys that are funding all your deals. 
Absolutely. You, you know, I have a question about an opportunity zone. So each state has selected certain tracks. Now they're going to attract investment. Though those census tracts will fundamentally change. Would would they at certain at some point can they not be a, a opportunity zone anymore? Or can a state select others? I mean, is it is an opportunity zone an opportunity zone forever? That's a great question. If you invest in a qualified opportunity zone business, okay, either corporate partnership or business property, and let's say it passes out of the opportunity zone realm. There's so much activity there that it's no longer a lower income track. You get to keep that capital gains deferral until 2047. So it does ultimately move out, but you're talking about deferral for, oh my gosh, almost 30 years. Okay. Let's move into a little bit with the funds, uh, Stephen. So, so the fund is really, for most investors, it's the panacea, but the reality is a lot of them, a lot of uh, investors, sponsors, as we call them, somebody who's actually putting these together, putting deals together, um, struggle because they don't have the track record uh, to, to, to get a fund going. In other words, that a blind fund where they're going to be investing and buying in, in, in properties and doing things inside of a particular, um, environment. Uh, so they tend to stick with the, 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 the newer syndicators tend to stick with the, uh, the, the one off 506 B or 506 C or 504, whatever it might be until they build a track record. But let's assume you've got an investor, a sponsor who has built a track record now. And there are people lined up to participate in their deals. Let's talk a little bit about the fund and how that would work with, with an opportunity fund and make sure that it's structured properly so that it stays within the guidelines. And I can tell you guys that I, we used to do a lot of this. There's a lot of money out there on 1031s that are looking for places that they can put, you know, pieces and nickels and dimes and things into it. And I, and, and I want to eventually be able to get into how you can maybe put some into a, 1031 and some into an opportunity fund and is that going to cancel each other out and that sort of thing. But, uh, but that'll be a, maybe another question in another day. Let's just start with the, uh, with the fund and where we start and what do we do to stay out of trouble with that, Stephen? Okay. The fund has obviously 90% of the assets of the fund have to be qualified opportunity zone businesses. Then you obviously, as I said earlier, to be a qualified opportunity zone business, 70% of the physical assets of that business have to be in the zone and 50% of the revenues have to come from the zone. Okay, so real estate check, so check. Yep. You got to check. Now you've got that check. Now you got to go over the security side. And I already mentioned you've got to pick an, an offering exemption that best sits, suits your needs. And probably even in the fund realm for a first or second time fund sponsor, 506B is still going to probably be a better bet because you're still going to have some unaccredited coming into the fund. Where you get the trick and trap on the securities side is not only does it call into play the Securities Act of 33, which people are vaguely familiar with, at least the exemptions from registration under it, because I've just mentioned 504, uh, 506B and 506C, but now the Investment Advisors Act walks in. So you got a whole nother area of securities law that could potentially walk in. Most funds, and in which case you'd have to have an investment advisor. Now, if the, if the investment advisor has less than $25 million under management, they're not registered with the SEC, and the SEC is out of the picture. However, if there's less than $25 million under management and some of the fund's investors are unaccredited, you're going to need to – to use an investment advisor, the fund sponsor is going to have to pick a registered investment advisor. The advisor may not play much a role, but you have to have one. Can, can we stop there for a second? Because I think for folks, you're, you're stepping into a world that a lot of folks are not familiar with. We're actually, we are actually registered investment advisors. And, okay, excellent. And, and have a state, have a state license. Um, but for most folks, or register through the state. But most folks don't even know how to find someone like that. How can folks go about trying to find if they're going to be doing the unaccredited investors in their deal? How are they going to find somebody who might be interested in doing real estate deals? And I would imagine some folks 
Some registered investment advisors would, are just going to not going to want to touch that with a ten foot pole. So, so well, others of them will be happy to accept. Others will be a, happy to a accept a modest fee for doing it. Yeah, correct. So, 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 how do we find? How do they find those folks? Well, a lot of the good news is a lot of RIAs are very registered investment advisors. We call it RIA for slang are very, very involved in their local chambers of commerce. They're very, very involved in their local BNI, Business Networking International. Some even go to RIA meetings. They're actually not hard to find. They're very, they're probably some of the easiest professionals to find. Yeah, and this is not your garden variety stock broker. That's a different deal. This is a, right, it's, exactly. It's, it's a, a whole reg- different area yeah, of securities. A whole, whole law, different yeah. area of securities. It's an investment advisor, not a stockbroker. And in the state of Florida, the, through the Department of Financial Regulation, they have a list of, and you can search for individuals that are in your town. So that's another way. I'm not sure how in other states it would be it would be handled, but certainly through the state of Florida, the Department of Financial Regulation has a, um, an investment advisory division that they can. They can every, every state in the secure every state securities division has the same list. Yeah. Also, FINRA, which is a financial institutions national regulatory authority. Yep. They maintain a comprehensive list. And I be, I've not, you know, I, I wouldn't be surprised if it's broken down by town as well. And the reason why I suggest the business groups is it's good to meet these people sure. face to face. You know, do you have some trust? Do you have some rapport? Yeah. Because they are going to be at least advising your fund. Mm-hmm. So, so, Stephen, I know that um, there was always there has been a lot of interest in Opportunity Zone funds, um, but there was also some. Uh, people were waiting for clarifications. There was a little bit confusion. Is the landscape now clear of, of what the rules are? The IRS has clarified some of the confusion in its proposed regulations. They've not gone final. Like, for example, one of the confusion they clarified is the law never defined what's a qualified opportunity zone business. Typical Congress. The IRS says you're an opportunity zone business if substantially all of the assets are in the opportunity zone, and the IRS then defines substantially all as 70%. Congress just used the vague phrase, substantially all, and everybody was running around bumping into each other for the last few months trying to figure out what that meant until the IRS came in. The other big clarification that the IRS did was in a revenue ruling. If somebody said, hey, I've got property, and I want to sell it, and use the proceeds to invest in an opportunity zone fund. The law says I can do it within 18 months. But what if the property is being developed? Sometimes it takes more than 18 months to even get a zoning change. And the IRS said we'll extend that up to 31 months. Those are the two big areas of confusion that were clarified. So now, now I think the landscape is becoming a lot clearer. So are you seeing a lot of opportunity funds forming? I'm starting to get a lot of calls from people. People were holding off until the IRS came up with proposed regulations because you don't want to get out there, do the offering, and then find out it didn't qualify. Right. That's the worst of all worlds. So there's a big hold off until the IRS came up with regulations. Now I'm starting to get a lot of calls. What do I need to do? So, Stephen, let's talk a little bit about 1031 exchanges because I said we were going to loop back around with them. Back in the day, uh, tenant in common, for example, was a was a was a big thing for 1031 exchanges. In other words, people trying to defer capital gains taxes to be able to roll into because they could put bits and pieces of 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 uh, of their 1031 into a ready made type of investment. Uh, and many times it was sort of leftover equity. In other words, they might have done a million dollar or two million dollar deal and they had $180,000 left over and they would put that $180,000 into a tenant in common. It worked out really well, but there were an issue with, with debt on that. And a lot of these investors that were in their late sixties and early seventies didn't really want to carry the debt. So that's a long explanation to get to the question of one, can you mix and match a 1031 with an opportunity zone investment. That's number two, number one. And then number two, wh- how do you deal with the debt uh, that ordinarily would have to be covered, uh, carried over from a 1031 exchange? In other words, if they're selling a piece of real estate that had debt on it, how would you deal with that investing in okay. an opportunity if zone? You're, let me start two with questions. the second one. If you're, selling, yep. 
if you're selling a piece of real estate that has debt on it, obviously the lender is going to want you to pay it off on sale. Okay, sure, of course. Assuming you got a, so you pay off the lender on sale. Lender's happy. Okay, and and that that's not that paying off a debt per se is not a taxable event from the IRS unless you're getting some forgiveness. The equity part, that part has to be all parked in an opportunity zone. Okay. So you can't mix and match. It's, it's you know, if you're going to do an opportunity zone, you got to do an opportunity zone. You can't put a piece of it in 1030 in some sort of 1031 and the remainder in an opportunity zone. It all has to be in an opportunity zone. Right. But the beauty of that is now you can take that equity and buy, say, investing membership units or limited partnership interests where you don't have to guarantee the debt on the new piece of business property in the opportunity zone. Whereas if you do 1031, you take the 500000 you got to buy a comparable piece of property for a million. You're looking at having to bear, you know, bear half million dollars in debt. Yeah. And I somebody mean, in their 70s, who wants that? No, I, I get it. It get, makes you much more flexible on not only the structure that you're going into, but also on the debt that you don't have to carry that debt over. You would be called what's referred to as boot in a 1031. And you, you wouldn't have that. Mm-hmm. You'd be able to strip that equity out. And man, for a lot of uh, older investors that are wanting to divide, divest themselves of the debt that typically is being held on real estate, it really gives them a lot of flexibility here, man. I mean, it's tremendous. Yeah, I, I think it's a fantastic opportunity. If it's structured properly from the securities law perspective, you know, and, and obviously when you're writing the private placement memorandum, there are going to be some very extensive tax disclosures on what it takes to qualify as a qualified opportunity zone fund and a qualified opportunity zone business. There are a few different disclosures I, I'll be making in the course of it, but it's it, it's a fantastic opportunity if done right. You know, the part that worries me a little is it's, it, it is such a great opportunity. But when you look at the opportunity zones on a map, I mean, they're not in great areas. And um, you wonder how much really opportunity there are in those zones. I'm sure a few developers will go in and, and be successful and, and do things. But, you know, others might just get lost in the glamour of being in an opportunity zone, but really not do something worthwhile with it. Well, in any real estate issue, the location is the biggest thing. You got to be very careful. If you can find opportunity zone property that is, say, in a neighborhood that may become very desirable, let's say they're putting a subway line through or a light rail line through, and now you've got some commercial developers who want to upzone property uh, or the property that's, say, nearby a hospital, something that's, it has to be probably something there that's attractive. And again, that that creates a little bit of a securities disclosure issue because one of the things you do early on in the private placement memorandum is describe the local environment. Having a mass transit or light rail system in connection with this opportunity zone legislation could be a real bonanza because that would allow a neighborhood to gentrify an up zone very quickly. Having a hospital nearby might be a pretty good idea as well. If nothing else, you get possible multifamily residential for the residents in, and interns and the people who work the longer shifts at the hospital. The buyer has to be where, but that's the case in any real estate transaction anywhere. Of course. And we see this all the time, Stephen, and it's one of those situations where you can tell the investor, but they're, at the end of the day, they're going to do what they're going to do. But uh, we're going to say it again. You don't make real estate investments based with the primary decision being some sort of tax avoidance strategy. The investment decision should be go, no go decision. Does it make sense? And, and, and if the, if the tax consequences or benefit is it pushes you over the edge, it should be the icing on the cake, not the primary reason why you're making a decision. And we see this, you know, all the time where people are coming out of a pretty decent investment and then they, they cram down into an investment that's a lot riskier and you're wondering whether it's going to pan out or not, all because they're going to defer two hundred, three hundred thousand dollars worth of taxes. That makes no sense. Pay the taxes rather than lose your entire principal amount. So it really comes down to look at the deal and does the deal make sense from a basic dollars, you know, a blocking and tackling standpoint. And the tax advantage should be the icing on the cake. And certainly your point, uh, Silverman is, you know, the, that, that, that the, the, the areas are going to be somewhat challenged. And we know from looking in some of these areas that, um, it can be tough to, uh, to, to make some of these deals, uh, make sense. But maybe it's the point where the tax 
consequences, the, the tax advantages will push investors over the top of you, icing to, to whether you're in a gray area of whether you go or no go. You want to look at the amenities in the area. Is this attractive to, say, a young, pro- young professionals? Is it close to restaurants? Is it close to downtown? Is there a subway or light rail? Now, it, is this a neighborhood that has the potential of gentrifying very quickly? Because 40, 50 years ago, I mean, I live in the D.C. area. There are neighborhoods in D.C. that no one would have invested in 50 years ago in their right mind. And today, anybody who's anybody in real estate is clamoring to get in there. It, it depends. on, And in other communities, it, it's no matter what the tax advantages are, it's still not going to make sense. It's the basic fundamentals, the blocking and tackling sure. before you even get to the tax strategies. Okay. So just so I'm clear, we you, you have a property, you sell it, and you take the proceeds, and you invest it in an opportunity zone, and your tax gets deferred, and that's, uh, and, and that's a wonderful bonus. What happens when, what happens if you don't, you just go out and buy a property in an opportunity zone, um, without having sold something first? Is there, are there any benefits on appreciation or? Well, you've created, you've created a new business in the opportunity zone. Absolutely. Absolutely. At that, at you will, you will get the deferral as well. Yes. In other words, you'll get the deferral on capital gains when you sell. Yes. You would have to hold it for five years to get a 10% deferral. You'd have to hold it for seven years to get a 15% deferral or to get to get the permanent deferral. You'd have to hold it 10 years. Hey, this is, say, Stephen Rinaldi. This is good stuff. If folks want to get in touch with you and learn more about it, I mean, your services are obviously you're helping investors put funds together. You're an attorney and, and you help structure some of those uh, those deals. So how would people go about doing that, learning more from you? Uh, they can clearly look at my website, stephenrinaldilaw.com. Uh, they can give me a call at 240-481-2706. Pretty much any time Monday through Friday from about nine in the morning to about 630 at night. And if it's an emergency and you're a current client, I do take Saturday calls. Awesome. Steven, is there anything else before we let uh, Mr. Rinaldi go? Stephen, no, thank you. We'll be seeing you in an opportunity zone and, and hopefully some of our listeners will also. Absolutely. I mean, it, it's it really could be a wonderful opportunity for a lot of people out there if structured, if structured correctly. If not structured correctly and people focus too much on the tax advantages and not enough on does the investment make sense? Well, then you're going to have problems. Yep. Good point. But, I mean, that, that's the case with any that's the case with any transaction. Absolutely. Hey, Stephen, we really appreciate time you invested with us today. And um, is there anything else before we let you go? Oh, that's it, gentlemen. Thank you very much for having me. Thanks, Stephen. And that was Stephen Rinaldi talking opportunity funds. Stephen, what were your thoughts? Eric, I thought the last part of our discussion really uh, summarized everything. You go into an investment to make a good investment. I Like anything else, opportunity funds is going to be the new shiny bright object and everybody's going to be talking about it and doing it. But you can't just invest in a property simply because it's in an opportunity zone. You have to make sure it's the right kind of investment. And then you have to structure it correctly. Yeah, guys, you know, we we talk about this, we hound on it, but don't make investments based on whatever tax savings. It should be, you're going to get, it should be based on the, cumulative picture. And if you don't believe me, why don't you go back and look at what happened after 1986 with limited partnerships, uh, these investments stra- structures that are, are are meant for people to do to get pushed in a particular direction. People, sometimes the irrational exuberance takes over and people end up making decisions that they get burned on. So the, it's, the, the opportunity fund in its, in its base is a great idea And is certainly worth taking a look at because it could push you over the edge into making an investment a go, no go decision. It's sort of in that gray area of do I do it? Do I don't do it? And then all of a sudden you get this tax advantage to it. It becomes an opportunity that you can't pass up. 
But as long as the numbers have to make sense, as long as the numbers make sense, then there's the icing on the cake is the is the terrific tax advantages that are that are inside of these uh, opportunities. Stephen uh, Stephen Rinaldi was a great speaker. He's, he's a repeat, a retread, as you say. Where else can we hear? Can folks hear other great guests talking about great topics? Well, the best place is to go to the investfloridashow.com, www.investfloridashow.com. There we have our archives of all previous podcasts and wonderful learning experiences. Also, it's so convenient to listen on, a mo- on your mobile device. Download the apps and you can listen while you're in the gym or on the road. Guys, as always, we appreciate the time that you invest with us each and every episode. And until next time, hasta la vista. You've just listened to the Invest Florida podcast with Eric Odom and Stephen Silverman. Join us every week for actionable real estate investment ideas. And of course, visit our website at www.investfloridashow.com for more shows and tips on how to earn a cash flow in the real estate market in Florida. While hosts and producers of the Invest Florida show have no reason to doubt the validity of comments of our guests, we do not warranty their accuracy. Please check with your legal, financial, and tax advisors before entering into any investment. Returns will vary from person to person and deal to deal based on unique circumstances. All information expressed in this show is for educational purposes only. Opinions of the guests are not necessarily shared by the hosts and producers of the Invest Florida Show.